Hey, thanks so much for being with us here at the Apologetics Canada Conference. I'm the one who's honored to be oh, here. Oh, I don't know about so that. Brad. Well, I'm, I'm excited that we have an opportunity to ask you a few questions. Okay. And uh, there's a couple that came in on Twitter and a couple that I have for you. And, um, you know, for me, I've got some questions I think you and I might be able to relate well to one okay. another. Um, so first was, um, people were asking about... Um, Evidence from a lot of the evidence you presented was between 20 and 30 years after right. the event, and people are saying, are there sources between 20 and 30 years, right, right immediately after Christ's death? Yes, yeah, that's, that's th I think there's good reason to believe that even the gospel writers, even those people who were gospel eyewitnesses, the folks who were the disciples of Jesus, uh, really believed that, that Jesus would come back in their own lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I think the initial transmission of the gospel uh, information, the eyewitness testimony, was simply verbal. It was just uh, we would talk about. It. They would they would go town to town and 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 testify. As a matter of fact. If you look at the book of Acts, you'll see that the way that the, the apostles actually uh, evangelized. You know, we think, well, how should we go out and evangelize next weekend? And maybe we, we examine some of the techniques you see online, like the way of the master. or what, How did the apostles actually testify? Hmm. You see that in the book of Acts. And repeatedly they testify, they, they evangelize as eyewitnesses testifying to the resurrection. Just go read through all those accounts. Mm -hmm. Over and over again, they're testifying as eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And I think there's good reason to believe that those apostles really b thought that that would be all would be necessary because Jesus would come back. Now, as they aged, it seems reasonable to me that uh, these folks would believe it's time, it's time for me to pen this, mm -hmm. to pass this on in a more formal way to those who will follow me because it appears that Jesus is not coming back. And you had the deaths of uh, brother uh, James, the brother of, of Jesus, others who died of the uh, set of close followers of Jesus, who I'm sure made the ones who were remaining think to themselves, maybe it's time for me to pen this mm. because uh, maybe he's not going to come back in my lifetime. So we start to see texts emerge at the end of the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses, I believe, from the early dating that I talked about a little bit at tonight's uh, talk. So I think that that's, so again, those folks lived mm -hmm. and saw Jesus, but weren't compelled to write about Jesus until sometime way. after in a formal way. So when we look at uh, pagan sources uh, that are, describe Jesus, it doesn't really surprise me that what you really have are pagans who, what's, what's important is not that the pagan source is 20 or 30, or it's important that the pagan source arrives at a time when eyewitnesses could say, no, it didn't happen that way. Mm. All of these writings were really saying, hey, do they happen at a time when living eyewitnesses could say this is not true? And if they were written after those eyewitnesses died, then I would be skeptical as well. If we can say those are written early enough, then I think we have good reason to believe that there, uh, when Paul says, hey, there's 500 more who saw the resurrected Christ, you can certainly contact them as well, then there's good reason to believe that this is a legitimate story, a legitimate account of what happened. Hmm. So that's how I look at it. It doesn't bother me as an investigator that the earliest sources I have that are pagan or non-Christian are in the 50s to 110. That doesn't bother me so yeah. much. What would bother me more is if uh, these are, occurred outside the uh, life of living eyewitnesses. That's the key for me. Okay, wow, thank you so much. Um, the, another question was you presented a lot of um, uh, pagan sources that uh, supported the New Testament and supported this. Is there, um, are there other scholars and other writings and other kind of formal documents that speak uh, of, a, of another viewpoint. Yeah, this is the power, I think, of the uh, non-Christian sources. In every one of these non-Christian documents, and I tried to limit tonight to just those uh, that are as early as possible. Mm -hmm. So when Thallus is quoted by Julius Africanus, I mean, people will say, well, you can't trust that's Julius Africanus. We don't have Thallus' original work. Well, even Julius Africanus is, is saying, hey, I don't think that Thallus has got it right. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though he's holding Thallus up as this guy that he says makes the case. He's kind of holding him up and saying, hey, this guy was wrong. Uh, but he's describing an, a, a document that appears very early in history. So, so what's interesting is all of these writers are not Christians. They're not supporting the Christian claims. They are denying the divinity of Christ. They're denying the, the resurrection. Mm -hmm. They are actually writing, but what's great about it is they back in unintentionally to a certain set of facts. In denying that Jesus is God, they do at least admit that Jesus lived. Okay. And denying that the resurrection occurred, they do at least admit that Jesus was crucified. Yeah. So you get these facts into the record, in uh, basically unintentionally. Mm -hmm. They aren't trying to support our case, but they end up supporting our case yeah. because they mention these things that happen to be true. Now let's talk about archaeology for a second. Okay. You know, a lot of times you'll have people who will say, gosh, you know, um, is there any archaeology that, that really runs against the claims of the New Testament? And you're starting to see every few years around Easter, mm -hmm. somebody will produce a movie, write a book, 
produce a DVD that claims to have some piece of archaeological evidence that yeah. makes a case against Christ. And, and it's not that these things don't pop up. They always do. Mm -hmm. The issue is, are, are they persuasive evidentially? Do they hold up under scrutiny? What you really have, the biggest problem you have with the New Testament, it seems to me, is that there are silence in certain areas archaeologically. We don't have archaeology for every single uh, thing that occurs in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But what archaeology we do have supports our case. But it is limited. It's only, it, there's only so much you can do with archaeology. And in those cases where I see uh, others bring in archaeological uh, uh, finds, mm -hmm. oh, here we got it, this great new find that demonstrates that Jesus' bones are in this box, whatever it may be. Uh, those never seem to hold up uh, ev evidentially. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they haven't held up evidentially. And yeah. as soon as that claim was made several years ago, I mean, it was retracted pretty quickly. Uh, it was mocked pretty quickly and, and really never held up under the, the heavy scrutiny of yeah. scholars. So I think that, yes, you, I, I would expect that those that don't believe what we say about Jesus would want to interpret every archaeological find they can against our claims. Mm -hmm. And that will happen. So I don't want Christians to be shaken by the fact they may occasionally get a claim pop up. Oh, look what we found over here. Let's take the time, take a deep breath, mm -hmm. and examine the claim and see if it's reliable. See how, how, how good and persuasive the case actually is. I think in the end, the archaeological evidence is far more persuasive in support of the New Testament claims than it is against the New Testament claims. Great. Well, I'm going to shift gears here a bit. Okay. Um, you know, being at the conference, you know, there's a lot of pastors, a lot of vocational kind of Christians. Right. But there was a lot of people that weren't. And, you know, you're one of the guys on the platform that has a 40-hour-a-week job that mm -hmm. doesn't involve apologetics. That's right. So can you tell us a bit about your journey into going from someone who has a job and a calling and a clear calling on their life to vocationally to someone that is now influencing the world of apologetics while also having a career? Right. Well, I wanted to say one thing to everyone who considers this, all of us who are working professionally in some other mm -hmm. field. And we come to conferences like this, and you sit and you listen to the, our, our heroes. You know, JP is a hero. Mm -hmm. Paul, Copan, all these guys are heroes. And I, I bet you that Mary, I'm so impressed with what Mary Jo has been able to do in a short career so far. Mm -hmm. So these are the heroes of apologetics that we get to listen to. And I'm like you, I sit in that audience and go, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. And at some point we have a tendency to say, well, if I could only jettison this life that I'm living now so I could become an apologist. That would be God's calling on my life. And it took me a lot of years to realize that I'm in God's calling on my life, mm -hmm. in this profession he's given me. And what he wants me to do is instead is to see this apologetics mission through the lens of the career that he's already given me. Mm -hmm. And it, it turns out, I think, that all of us, if you're an electrician, there's some aspect of your life that you can then use to analogize to make the case for Christ. There's some experience you've had that you can analogize for people, that you, you can reach people I can't reach. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is the case for all of us. So what I really want us to see is this is not an option for us. This calling on our lives is not an option to be an apologist. You can't say, well, gosh, that's for you, Jim, but I, I couldn't do it. Well, 1 Peter 3.15 does not give us that option. He's writing, Peter's writing to all of us. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, I don't have the gift of this or the gift of that, but we don't get a choice when it comes to He doesn't say, hey, if you don't have the gift of apologetics, don't worry about it. Yeah. No, I, I, this is the, I want people to be passionate about what it is they're called to be. I think apologetics is an, an, an integral part of what it is we're called to be as Christians. Now, how do we do that when we're working 40 hours a week? You start small. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to be the super Christian when I first became a Christian. I, I was 35. I, was, I spent an entire life pushing against God, angry about uh, some things that happened in my uh, childhood related to my mom and, and organized religion, having real problems, right? And when I finally got saved, I wanted to, I felt like I lost so much time. You know, I wanted to ramp this up quickly. Mm -hmm. How do I go from zero to 50? So I got saved, I started to volunteer, you know, I joined a church staff at some point, and I started a seminary. Mm -hmm. That's not for everybody. But it was helpful to dig deeper into theological issues at, that, at, the, at the graduate level, right? Mm -hmm. And I did that, and it took seven years to actually get that degree. Yeah. And during that time I was pastoring, I was volunteering, I was getting, trying to get in the game. Do something. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm asking. Just yeah. do something. Now, it could be very small. Yeah. We started the website as a way to post the things we were teaching our youth group. These are just the messages. They're kind of not great. I mean, it's not the greatest. You're not going to get the greatest description of the cosmological argument at pleaseconvinceme.com. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the, the message that I delivered as a pastoral piece to a youth group. So it's going to have some kind of quirkiness about it because it was delivered as a sermon. Yeah. But I think it has its own merit, and you'll, everyone's got a different view of this and a different way of approaching it. That's what I'm trying to say. The way you would write it, you could say, well, you know what? People have already written about the cosmological argument. People have already written about the teleological. So what? Yeah. You haven't written about it, yeah. and you've got an ability to reach people that I can't reach. Yeah. 
So write about it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to hurt us to have one more article about these issues online. So start small. Okay. Start a blog. Start a, I mean, podcasts are pretty easy to do. Yeah, I mean, we we did our first one. We it was you know a, a micro. It was a portable microphone. I've done podcast out of a car driving to work. Hmm. You know, just 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 do something, and you'd be amazed if you just steady the course, be faithful, retain your passion. The other thing, you know, when you work with young people, I don't know about you, but I I was older when I started, and I was already gray, and I had kids who were in the ministry, so I was already like a dad mm -hmm. to a lot of the kids in my ministry, and I felt old. And I felt like, gosh, you know, I really want to um, be young. I would like to be young at heart, at least. Mm -hmm. So I started to think about what is it to be young at heart? Yeah. I think there's two dimensions that I would like to encourage everyone to think about as they become apologists. One dollar apologists, that we always talk yeah. about, right? Passion's the first one. Young people are passionate. You can say, hey, we're going to take that hill. And you know what? Young people will take that hill with you. You can say, we're going to do this crazy mission trip. It's going to involve this and that and this and that. And if you're my age, you're going, oh, I got to burn vacation time. And I, you know, I just can't make it. I'm so sorry. But young people are like, hey, when do we go? Yeah. They're passionate. If you want to be young at heart, be passionate. If you want to reach a generation that needs apologetics desperately, be passionate. Two is be teachable. Because young people are teachable. As we get to be older, we're like kind of like setting our ways. You hear that expression? He's kind of setting his ways. I don't ever want to be setting my ways. I want to always be teachable. You got to be able to correct me. I got to be humble when I, when I sin, when I do the wrong things. I got to be teachable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to present the way I see this, this evidence, and I may be wrong about many dimensions of it. Yeah. Be teachable. Admit when you're wrong and change your course. If we can be teachable and passionate, I think we can actually relate to a generation that wants to see that kind of transparency in us. But what I'm disappointed about is when people aren't passionate. So the one thing I hope to do tonight is to encourage people to be passionate, to step out and do something. Mm -hmm. And that'll be enough. As you kind of stay the course over time, that thing will grow. And you'll reach more and more people. And, and try to resist the temptation I've, I've, I've sinned in this area. I can remember being younger and having the sin of selfish ambition. Let go of that. Yeah. Let go of ambition. Just do it and see what God will do with it. And be patient. Yeah. And it's going to do something. Whatever it's going to do, God's going to do it for you. So, so at the end, that's what I would encourage people to just step out. You've got the 40-hour week job. I get all that. Mm -hmm. I've got that, too. If you're passionate and you're teachable, something good will happen. Cool. Well, I do have a question about your 40-hour week job. Okay. Um, you know, for a lot of people that are at this conference, they're older. They've been in their careers for a long time. Yeah. And, and when you start off and you're at the bottom of the totem pole, there's, there's a bit more freedom to talk about your faith and talk about things at work because everyone's kind of low. And then the higher you get up, the more that there's kind of um, leadership challenges and saying, I'm a clearly a leader over that person, and they would have to listen to me no right. matter what I was talking about. So how do you incorporate being an apologist into having a career where you're an influential person and you have people working under you and working with you and incorporating Christ into your work life. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard because I knew a lot of these folks when I wasn't a Christian. And a lot of these folks will remind me of that. Mm -hmm. I say, oh, come on, Jim, I remember you did when you were, before you got saved. And I, yeah, there's a lot, of, but to me, I, Oh, I always ask, I mean, you're afraid that I'm being hypocritical? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a hypocrite. But to have a, to be different than I was 15 years ago is not to be a hypocrite, it's to be transformed. Yeah. And I'm hoping that all of us can be transformed. God has the power, I would hope, yeah. to transform me, and I've seen that. Uh, and so I think the first thing is I've got to earn equity with the people I work with. Yeah. Before I can speak in anyone's life, I have to have a place of equity in that life. Mm -hmm. And I have to have somebody, why would I listen to Jim? Mm -hmm. And and the question is, do, you, do we are we living a way in a way that people actually say, yeah, I'd be willing to listen to you, or are we living in a way that really is uh, kind of detached and not connected enough that even if I have the truth and hold the truth and care about the person I'm talking to, I haven't invested anything in this person to have any equity yeah. that would allow me to speak to his life. Hmm. That's really the issue. So the first thing we need is we need to take some time to earn some equity with people. Uh, you know, you don't. It's it's and Rick Warren is a guy that is is fairly controversial at times. And it has been recently. I can tell you, though, that one thing you said that always stuck with me is that you don't win your enemies. You win your friends. Mm -hmm. And you win, if you have an enemy, you first have to bridge to that enemy. Mm. To, okay. So, because you win your friends. And it's important, I think, as we, as apologists, that we go out and we are relational first. Yeah. Is that I'm going to have impact on the, and then my job, there's lots of partners I've had who are tired of Jim, you know talking about God. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to just earn the opportunity to speak into their lives and speak into it first from character. Now, again, I'm hesitant to be into this kind of relational apologetics where I don't really want to speak the truth, I want to live the truth. No, no look, you got to do both. 
And you've had some trial and error in oh, this, too. Oh, gosh, yes. You yeah. Know, yeah, you got to do both. I mean, I've been the guy who's been aggressive and really forward with people and really wanted to shake the tree. And I've been the guy who said, I'm going to spend, spend a year and never got around to ever discussing Christ with yeah. the guy. So you don't want to be in those two extremes. But I think you, you can't neglect one for the other, at least. Let's put it that way. And so I think I've got supervisors who are above me who uh, I think respect the fact that this is what God has called me to do. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily agree with me. They're not necessarily Christians. Yeah. But I think they understand that I love them as brothers in law enforcement and sisters in law enforcement first. Yeah. That we're united by a common cause. That's the powerful thing I, I, I talked about tonight a little bit, is that, yeah, there's lots of folks that you're united by, by cause with. Mm -hmm. But as Christians, we're united by a common father. I want to get to a place with this good friend of mine who I'm working with. Yeah, we're united by a common cause. We're both cops. Yeah. And we're both working for the same cause. But I want to be united by a common bond and family mm -hmm. that we have a common father. Yeah. I know we already do, but you don't know I, we, we, that we do. Mm -hmm. And once you figure that out, We'll have a different kind of relationship altogether. Wouldn't it be great to have that kind of family relationship with the people we work with, to get beyond common dreams and common goals and common ambitions to a common father? Yeah. And that's what I think we're trying to do with, with apologetics. We're trying to, get, to move across that bridge, if that helps. That's great. Hey, thank you so much thanks for, for your time. Thanks for I really appreciate it. Thanks for your it. thoughts, and thanks for being an inspiration to those of us who work 40 hours a week. Yeah, we do our best, right? One dollar yeah. apologist. That's, that's all we have to be. Okay, thanks so cool. much, Jim. All right, thanks. Appreciate it.